Hello everyone, in this lesson we're going to begin our study of derivative shortcuts. So you've been studying the limit definition of a derivative the last week or so, and taking different derivatives using the limit definition. While you'll never have to go through the long process of working out a derivative using the limit definition again, you still need to recognize that structure of the limit definition in certain problems, so it's important to not forget that at its heart the derivative is defined um, using the limit definition. However, it is now open season to use different shortcuts to take derivatives. So, the first shortcuts we'll talk about are for constant functions and also functions that have real number exponents. There's a nice shortcut for each one of them. There's also a pretty intuitive way to deal with functions that are multiplied by a constant and also sums and differences of functions. We'll also talk about determining higher order derivatives being second and third derivatives. And talk more about using appropriate notation uh, for first and higher order derivatives, both prime notation and what's known as Leibniz notation after one of the founders of calculus. Our first shortcut is what's called the constant rule. So the constant rule says that we take the derivative with respect to x of a real number constant c, we just get 0. The explanation behind this one is fairly simple. If we drew the graph of the constant function y equals c, we know it's just a horizontal line with a height of c. And if we're taking the derivative of this function, so if we took y prime, we know we're just getting a function that measures the slope at every point on the graph y equals c. So knowing that a horizontal line has a slope of 0 at every point, it makes sense that the derivative of y equals c uh, should just be 0. Another fundamental shortcut we'll be using a lot is what's called the power rule. So if we take the derivative with respect to x, of x to the n, where n represents some real number exponent. The power rule says that we drop that original exponent in front and then lose a power of x. So we get n times x to the n minus 1. So let's talk about a few simple examples of using this. Let's say we took the derivative of x cubed, and let's say we took the derivative of x to the ninth, and let's also look at, say, 5x. So in the first case, if we took the derivative of x cubed, which we'll label as y prime, the power rule says we drop that original exponent of 3 in front, and then decrease the power of x by 1, so we have 3x squared. For x to the ninth, same idea, we drop that original exponent of 9 in front, and then we lose a power of x, so we have x to the eighth. And for 5x, you could think of this in two different ways. If we thought of it using the power rule, Technically, that's x to the first power, so the 1 drops in front uh, with that 5 to just make 5. Then if you lose a power of x, you technically have x to the 0. But what is x to the 0 power? It's just 1, so the derivative there would be 5. Uh, perhaps another way to think of that is you're taking the derivative of the linear function 5x, and since derivative measures slope, what's the slope of 5x? It's just 5. The beauty of the power rule is that it can also be applied to functions that can be written as a power of x, but may not be expressed that way to start with. So let's say we have the function y equals 1 over x. We could write that as x to the minus first power, and then use the power rule to take its derivative. So again, if we follow the power rule, if we take the derivative with respect to x of x to the negative 1, that original exponent of negative 1 drops in front, and then we subtract 1 from that original exponent. So be careful that subtracting 1 from negative 1 would give us an exponent of negative 2. And if we choose to write that using positive exponents, that would be negative 1 over x squared. So again, just a few examples of using the power rule um, to take derivatives. Next up, we have what's called the constant multiple rule. So this derivative rule allows us to take the derivative of a constant times a function. Now I'm going to write this in two different notations. One is what's called Leibniz notation, and the other one prime notation. So this tells us how to take the derivative with respect to x of a real number constant times some function u, let's say. So again, c is a real number constant, and u is the function. So in this case, it would just be c times the derivative of that function u. So we'll say c times du dx. Or if we wrote this using prime notation, we could say let's take the derivative with respect to x of c times f of x. So again, c is a real number constant, and then we have a function of x. This derivative would be c times f prime of x. So a way to think of this is that constants kind of flow along for the ride when you're taking derivatives. 
So how would you use this? Let's say we were going to take the derivative of 8x squared. So in this case, c would be 8 and u or f of x would be x squared. So in taking the derivative here, if we took the derivative of 8x squared, well, we know how to take the derivative of x squared. We drop the 2 in front and then lose a power of x. And that constant of 8 basically absorbs that 2 that drops down. So in dropping the 2 down with that 8, we'd get 16. 8 times 2 makes 16. And then we'd have x to the first, or just x. So again, don't overthink this. Basically think of it as those constants float along for the ride when you're taking derivatives. Another intuitive rule is the sum or difference rule. So again, if we wrote this in Leibniz notation, the derivative with respect to x of a function u added or subtracted to a function v is just the sum or difference of those two derivatives. That would be du dx plus or minus dv dx. And in prime notation, let's say we take the derivative with respect to x of f of x plus or minus g of x. In prime notation, this would be f prime of x plus or minus g prime of x. So this basically allows us to differentiate term by term when we have sums or differences. So how will we use this one? Let's say our function was 5x cubed plus 7x. We we're going to take the derivative here. So the sum or difference rule says we can take the derivative of each term of the sum. What's the derivative of 5x cubed? We drop the 3 down with that 5 to get 15, and then we have x squared when we lose the power of x, and the derivative of 7x would just be 7, so we have 15x squared plus 7. So again, don't overthink this, fairly intuitive. When you have sums or differences, you can essentially differentiate term by term. We can also have what are known as higher order derivatives, being a second derivative, a third derivative, a fourth derivative, and so on the second derivative being the derivative of the derivative. And as we go through the course, we'll see there are applications of the first and second derivative we'll use a lot, and it's important to be comfortable using the notation for these derivatives. So let's say we're given the function y equals f of x. Let's write down the notations we could use for both its first derivative and some of its higher order derivatives. So in the case of a first derivative, we've seen both prime notation and Leibniz notation Prime notation we could label as y prime for the derivative of that function. We could also label it as f prime of x. We gave it the label y equals f of x. And if we use Leibniz notation, we could call it dy dx, being the derivative of the function y with respect to x. Um, or in this case, you could also get away with saying df dx. We gave it the label f of x as well. Now for a second derivative, if we're using prime notation, we simply just use two primes, meaning y double prime or f double prime of x. And if you're using Leibniz notation, you represent the second derivative by using a 2, and it's interesting where the notation places the 2's. In the numerator, it's d squared y. In the denominator, you'd have dx squared. So I guess the way to understand this is the d in the numerator represents taking the derivative of the function y, and in the denominator, the x there represents which variable you're taking the derivative with respect to. So think of it as you're taking the derivative of the function y twice with respect to x twice. So again, the second derivative is simply just the derivative of a derivative. So again, you've taken the derivative twice, which is why the squared goes next to the d in the numerator. And for df dx, we could also say d squared f over dx squared. And for a third derivative, Similar notation, you could have y triple prime, f triple prime of x, and say d cubed y over dx cubed, or d cubed f over dx cubed. And at a certain point, prime notation actually becomes difficult to keep track of. So let's say we're doing a fourth derivative or higher. Oftentimes, we'll stop using the little tick marks for the primes and instead indicate it like this. With parentheses, we'll put a 4 in there to indicate the fourth derivative. And similarly, we'll put parentheses with a 4 to indicate the fourth derivative rather than using four tick marks. And obviously, with Leibniz notation, you can keep using that number 4 for dx to the fourth and d4th f over dx to the fourth.
So again, with prime notation past a certain point, depending on how neat your handwriting is, it could be difficult to count how many tick marks you've been using, but uh, with Leibniz notation, it's pretty clear which derivative you're dealing with. So it's good to be comfortable using these different notations. We'll go back and forth and using them, um, both notations at different points. Now let's look at an example that combines all the different shortcuts we've talked about together. We're asked to determine the derivative of this function. That's a sum or difference of several different um, terms. So we'll be using the sum or difference rule and taking this derivative. Um, many terms are written in a way that we could directly apply the power rule, but there's a few terms that we need to change the form of before we apply the power rule. In particular, this 1 over x squared is not written as a power of x, um, nor is this term 5 root x or that 1 over root x term. So our first step is to rewrite the function in a form that allows us to apply the shortcuts we know so far, being the power rule, the constant rule, and the constant multiple rule, and so on. First term we're going to leave as x to the fifth. Second term we'll leave as 3x to the fourth. I am going to rewrite this third term to reveal how we'll use the constant multiple rule. x cubed divided by 5 is equivalent to 1 fifth multiplied by x cubed. That'll reveal how we'll take that derivative a little bit easier. And when we get to this term 1 over x squared, that's equivalent to x to the negative second power. So we've now written that term as a power of x. And with this next term, root x, we need to recognize that's equivalent to x to the 1 half power. Again, important to be comfortable with both negative exponents and fractional exponents. So that term is equivalent to 5x to the 1 half. And that's now in a form we could use the power rule and the constant multiple rule. And 1 divided by root x, well that's 1 divided by x to the 1 half. And if we chose to write that as a power of x, that would become x to the negative 1 half power if we brought that up. And then there's the plus 4 in the end. So notice we have not taken a derivative yet. It's important to recognize we've still labeled this as the original function f of x. And we've just written every term in a form where it reveals how we'll use the power rule, the constant multiple rule, and so on. So let's now take the derivative of this function term by term. So the derivative of this function, which we'll label f prime of x, we'll go term by term and use the power rule and constant multiple rule. So x to the fifth, drop the five down and lose the power of x, that would be five x to the fourth. Three x to the fourth, we drop the four down with three to get 12 through multiplication, we'd have x cubed. And this next term will show a little bit more work than we might ordinarily do. That'd be minus one fifth multiplied by the derivative of x cubed, which is three x squared. So again, just revealing how we'll use the constant multiple rule there. For x to the negative second power, we'll drop the negative two down. And be careful, when you subtract 1 from negative 2, we'd have negative 3 as the power we're left with there. Next term, the minus 5 will float along, and we'll take the derivative of x to the 1 half. Well, what is that? That's 1 half drop down. And again, be careful. If we subtract 1 from 1 half, we're left with negative 1 half as our new power of x. And for that term, x to the negative 1 half, the minus 1 half drops down. And again, be careful. We subtract 1 from 1 half, negative a half, negative a half, minus 1, what's subtracting 2 over 2 would be negative 3 over 2. That's our new power of x. And the derivative of that plus 4 in the end is 0. Don't forget to differentiate that last plus 4. So this is the derivative, although there is some simplification we can do, especially in terms of some of the coefficients. So let's write this cleaned up a little bit. So again, the derivative of f here would be 5x to the fourth plus 12x cubed. If we multiply the 1 fifth and the 3 in this expression, we'd have negative 3 fifths x squared. We'll leave this term as negative 2x to the negative 3 for now. This term, if we multiply 5 by a half, we'd have negative 5 over 2, x to the negative 1 half, and then negative 1 half x to the negative 3 over 2. So that's a fine form to leave the, derivative, leave the derivative in, but we could also write things in terms of positive powers of x. So just to show you another form you might see your answer in, say you're on a multiple choice section of a test, um, or you just prefer to write things with positive exponents, you could express those last three terms a little bit differently. So again, showing you a different form for this. First three terms will leave exactly the way they are. Now, if we chose to write that fourth term, negative 2 x to the negative third, with a positive exponent, that would be negative 2 over x cubed. 
And this term here, if we chose to write that with a positive exponent, would be negative 5 over 2x to the 1 half. So if you think of what happens there, it's really 5 over 2 times 1 over x squared, which would simplify to 5 over 2 times x to the 1 half. And this last term, you'd have 1 over 2x to the 3 halves. Again, because that's really 1 half multiplied by 1 over x to the 3 halves. Multiplying those together, you'd have 1 over 2 times x to the 3 halves. So that's another alternate form you could write the derivative in. So this example had a lot of twists and turns you might encounter in it, and kind of summarizes all the different shortcuts we've talked about. Our next example has us practice taking first, second, and third derivatives, so certain higher order derivatives, and we'll also use the appropriate notation for those derivatives in this as well. So for the first derivative, we could label it as dy dx, um, or we could also label it as y prime. So I'll say dy dx, which could be labeled as y prime. That would be our first derivative. Uh, we could simply just apply the power rule here to each term. So we'd have 12x squared plus 18x. The derivative of 10x would be 10, and the derivative of that 5 is 0. So that would be appropriate notation for the first derivative. For the second derivative, again, we could say d squared y over dx squared, or y double prime. That would be, again, through the power rule. If we take the derivative of y prime, that's what y double prime would be, we'd have 24x, that 2 drops down with that 12, plus the derivative of 18x is 18, and the derivative of that plus 10 would be 0. And then for the third derivative, we could label that as d cubed y over dx cubed, or y triple prime. That would be simply just the derivative of y double prime. So the derivative of 24x would be 24, and the derivative of 18 would be 0. So again, just showing you how taking higher order derivative works. Pretty intuitive. How do you find y double prime? Take the derivative of y prime. How do you find y triple prime? Take the derivative of y double prime, and so on. To end this lesson, here are a few practice questions for you to try to make sure you've absorbed all the shortcuts we've talked about. The first one has you take the derivative of this function g of x. So make sure you're expressing every term in a form that allows you to apply the basic rules we've talked about, being the power rule and the constant multiple rule. And the second problem has you find the first, second, and third derivative of this polynomial function.